Hello, I'm Steve Hunt from the Bristol Radical History Group and I'm going to do a short talk about Angela Carter, the writer, and her relationship to Bristol. So Angela Carter, socialist, feminist writer, um, probably fair to say she was one of the most acclaimed English writers of the late 20th century. Um, so famous for novels such as Wise Children, Nights at the Circus, short story collection, Bloody Chamber in particular. Uh, perhaps what's not maybe not quite so well known is her relationship to here in the West Country. Uh, but she lived in the Royal York Crescent in Clifton. Uh, they moved here in 1961 and they lived right through, six, through the 60s through to 1969. Um, and then also um, Angela Carter herself actually lived back in, in Bath in the mid 70s from around about 1970. 1974 to 1976 so actually not an inconsiderable part of her adult life was spent living in the west country um and and, and she died uh, sadly prematurely in in 1992 of of lung cancer so um it was quite a considerable part of her life um now i've written a book called angela carter's provincial bohemia a counterculture in 1960s and 1970s Bristol and Bath. Uh, so as the name suggests, that's there's really two integrated themes there. There's Angela Carter and her work while she was living here during those years in Bristol and Bath, um, but also um, around those period of times as the alternative circles that she, she moved in when she was living here at the time. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is really sort of the impact of Bath in particular upon Angela Carter and her um, her own attitudes to our historic diverse city. So I've suggested that the West Country had a really important inspiring influence on here so that might be quite a bold claim so you might want to know what the evidence is for that and I think really it's true to say that there's probably two schools of thought about Angela Carter's relationship to uh, Bristol and her feelings about her life in Bristol so and both of those would have some elements of truth so one version is the version in the recent BBC documentary called of Wolves and Women and according to that view Angela Carter um, it's like disappointed with the Bristol that she found when she moved here in 1961 um, she found that the work opportunities were limited here she found herself perhaps locked in an increasingly loveless marriage. And her response to that was basically to lock herself up in a room and to type ferociously, pounding on the keyboard. Um, and she knocked out five um, of her novels while she was here, five pieces of writing while she was here, um, really as a way of perhaps creating alternative realities to escape into. So her really good friend, uh, famous novelist, Salman Rusty. He very much put her um, self-realisation, if you like, as a, as a writer to her, her years living in Japan from uh, around about 1970, in the early 70s, is the really key point um, in her life. So she went to Japan in 1969, and that was what really exhilarated in his, his account. And that's really when, when Angela Carter became um, Angela McCarter, the writer, so infinitely more cosmopolitan, he's, he's suggesting, than Bristol. Angela Carter's biographer, Edmund Gordon, he, he again pointed to the lack of opportunities that she initially found when she moved here in 19, early 1960s Bristol. So in the invention of Angela Carter, his uh, biography of her, he points out that she, she wrote letters to the uh, uh, BBC, application letters to the BBC and to the Bristol Post. She even uh, sent an application letter to the uh, Bristol uh, bookshop, George's bookshop, which those of you lived in, in the area for many years will remember had, uh, used to be uh, uh, in several of the top uh, blocks of Park Street were all run, uh, all Bristol uh, George's bookshop at that time. So I think I wonder, though, whether he, he describes his application letters, actually, whether they were more speculative letters. Uh, that, that she wrote rather than letters for specific uh, vacancies uh, when she came here because she'd already been writing 
and uh, working as a, uh, a journalist when she moved to the city in, in 1961. Um, but I suppose whatever the case is, that, that whole cluster of rejections um, probably had quite a big impact on her. And actually what's quite interesting, I think, is it in a way it created a, a uh, created a, an opportunity for her because her, her response to, to all those uh, rejections and not having any work was that uh, I must strive to be an artist after all, she confided. So my opinion is actually Bristol was a little bit more dynamic than that account suggests and my emphasis is is quite different in some ways. Um, so when she moved here in the early 1960s, I think Angela Carter really learned a huge amount and really developed as a writer when, when she was living here. Um, because of the nature of Bristol itself, it's kind of a, a haunted city, if you like. It's, it's uh, got its um, place of beauty and dereliction. It's, it has its uh, slave trading past. It has its uh, imperialist past, um, but it's also got stunning natural beauty. It's uh, based on the four rivers. Um, so the, the natural environment is amazing. It's got the woods, it's got its green spaces. Um, and of course, it's got the great Avon Gorge as well, which was very, very close to where Angela and uh, Paul Carter were living up in the Royal York Crescent in the, during the 1960s. It's also got hugely varied architecture. And uh, they, were, they were lucky enough to live in the, uh, in those days, far more affordable flat in Royal York Crescent at the time. Um, it's supposed to be one of the, uh, it is one of the longest uh, terraces in in of its kind in Europe and above all I would say that the, the the city was just full of fantastic characters both historic characters and characters that were still alive on the streets and people that she would have met and mixed with when she moved to Bristol during the 1960s. Uh, three of Angela Carter's first novels were all based in Bristol um, set in Bristol peopled by characters she knew or had observed uh, in locations around the city. So even though Bristol itself is never actually named in the in any of these novels, uh, it's, it's definitely uh, written about her experiences in Bristol when she moved here. And there's various locations in Bristol are, uh, are quite clear from the from the novels themselves. So the first novel, uh, 1966, was Better Dance. Uh, so that was written, written when she was in her mid twenties. Talking about her later, she made it. She was explicit that it was based on people that she knew in Bristol. She disclosed that its characters were loosely based on people that she'd met when she moved here um, during the early and mid sixties. There's a quote from one of her letters: "Shadow Dance didn't exactly give mimetic copies of the people I knew, but it was absolutely as real as the milieu I was f familiar with." It was set in provincial Bohemia. Um, now the other two novels that make up what are known as the Bristol Trilogy, obviously also set here in the in the city. Uh, her second novel set in the of the Bristol Trilogy is uh, Several Perceptions, published in 1968. And then Love. Love, I think, was published in 1971, but it was certainly written here during the 19, late, late 1960s, so a slightly different uh, mood in, in love, uh, written around about uh, late 68, 1969, something like that. So I think uh, the provincial Bohemia to which she referred and which uh, I've, I've used as the title of my book, for Angela Carter, it, it wasn't a term of um, endearment, but it wasn't a term of sort of patronising cosmopolitan either. I think it more expresses um a place in a, a circle that was more of uh, um a source of intrigue for her so she was kind of captivated by these characters she met charmed by them repelled by one or two of them as well i think um but by the characters and the haunts that she found here um it was a world that she was a part of as well during the time she was here as well so she wasn't just an onlooker um but she was in some ways distinct so she moved within these circles did actually have quite a lively um, social circle, I, I would say, from 
reasonably early days here through her connections with the, the folk scene um but uh yeah is a zoe brennan expert on angela carter has commented on her time in the city her perspective was uh, a london centric one so, so i don't think she was ever really considered as health or became a, an indigenous bristolian by any means so I suppose the question is, well, what did she make, take from Bristol and what what fed, what ideas did she take? What fed into her work? What were the inspirations that she found when she uh, was living here in Bristol in the, in the mid 60s that uh, were so impactful on her um, development as a writer? One thing would be the folk revival that uh, was in full steam when the Carters moved here from London in the early 60s. And they were not only consumers of the of folk music but they were very much um at the heart of it they set up folk clubs in the bear hotel in hotwells and the lansdowne in clifton and then i think probably from folk music angela carter developed a real passion for narrative and a strong sense of um passion for characterization from the folk scene the local folk clubs um also sparkling with political commitment and uh, political uh, debates would have been going on within the folk movement and particularly in the folk revival. So very strong connections to the very early, uh, the great social movements that emerged at that time. So particularly the anti-nuclear movement and both Angela and Paul went on the very first border Marston marches organized by campaign for nuclear disarmament in the late 50s, early 60s. Um, and also the civil rights movement as well would have been very much a part of that and the anti-apartheid movement. Um, during the, the, the mid 1960s as well. Uh, I'd also say that her interest in folk traditions, uh, they led her to, to write her dissertation on the on um, folk theme and looking at uh, a, a traditional medieval ballad when she studied for her degree at Bristol University. So uh, sort of 62, 63, um, she became a student in English literature at Bristol University. Also during the 1960s, the folk movement maybe moved away from its uh, more purist roots and uh, merged into a kind of uh, on the fringes of that there was this uh, world of kind of avant-garde and performance um, particularly at the Lansdowne Hotel which uh, which uh, all kinds of performance and burlesque events were going on um, which took place in one of her favourite haunts the, uh, the the Lansdowne in Clifton so she's very much part of all that. Um, I mentioned her political commitments and uh, she said in two separate conversations with two old friends towards the end of her life, so Susanna Clapp and also Christopher Frailing, she talked about the way that her one of the most important um, political influence in her life was by meeting um, and spending time chatting to anarchists in the Barclay Cafe, which is, uh, which is still there. I think it's a Weatherspoons now opposite the Wills Building at Bristol University. So that used to be where she would hang out and talk to poets and talk to situationists and anarchists. Um, I was lucky enough to uh, make contact uh, with some of her friends from the from the folk scene and from the Barclay Cafe for my book. So a lot of what I've done is based on people that she mixed with and with um, original uh, oral history sources. Uh, the other thing that comes across from her looking at some of her journals is that she really read voraciously when she was living in Clifton. So she drew up this really ambitious, challenging um, program of reading, literature, politics, um, philosophy, and she took extensive notes throughout everything that, that she read. Um, so all of that would have been uh, really important and seminal in her development um, during those years for sure. Um, the other thing she did is she took a lot of her ideas just from direct observation. So uh, but let's join Angela Carter in the pub for a moment. So she loved to socialise, but she also would just sit sometimes watching the people watching, watching the clientele in the pubs and clubs. And she do jotted down quite a lot of notes uh, when she was doing that. So um, she was, uh, yeah, there's uh, she would go to the Bathurst which is now the Louisiana down in the center. Um, she went to pubs over in Lawrence Hill, over in East Bristol, um, but also in the Hot Wells area as well. So uh, here she is, some notes from a lively night in the 
Plume of Feathers in Hot Wells in 1966. A folk group, two guitars, drums, a plump woman in a very, very tight blue cotton dress, and she drank gin and lime, which is art imitating life again. Old, old songs, putting on the style, when the saints. A girl sang up from the floor with a full-throated, old-fashioned music hall voice, op art top, short black skirt, dancing, shaking. An old, old man in a cap, possibly the most toothless man in the world who ever lived, got up to the microphone and sang goodnight, Irene. Everybody sings, if I will, you will, so will I, to the tune of she'll be coming round the mountain. So while there may have been some whole neighbourhoods that she didn't set foot in, Angela Carter really did see the city from many angles while she was here. She eventually worked as a freelance reporter. So she did start working as a reporter in the end. Um, she spent many hours in the city's museums, the auctions, and one of the auctions appears in Shadow Dance. Even worked for a spell at the Locarno Ballroom, and she worked in the uh, the cafe at the, the Bristol Zoo. So... I don't, whether that was for for money or whether that was uh, partly to just soak up some of the um, the local colour as well, which has fed, fed through into many of her novels. So I hope that gives you a little bit of uh, context for Angela Carter's life in Bristol. Uh, got much more to say about the alternative society that she mixed in while she was here, the heart heartland of that kind of cultural counterculture activity, uh, which was in Clifton at the time, which seems slightly difficult to believe now. You're probably more likely to find that in areas like. Uh, St. Weirbergs and Easton and Montpellier, um, but at the time, uh, the county culture was very much focused on um, Clifton. As to a final relationship with Bristol, I'm going to conclude that in the end, I think it was something of what I would say was an amicable separation. So her rupture with her apparently emotionally uh, wounded husband, Paul, don't think he wanted to get divorced, but they uh, ended up with a separation in 19. 61 and had a formal divorce um, in 1972. Um, however, she did stay in touch with long to after she moved out of Bristol in 1969. She did stay in touch with long term friends here, actually through to through to the, uh, the remainder of her life. She would come back to events here. So she very much continued and maintained a connection to the West Country. And sadly, it was some of her dearest friends to whom she wrote in 1972 to convey the news that, that she'd had lung cancer. And there were definitely some Bristolians at her funeral and the memorial service that was held after at the uh, after she died. So uh, I'd say that her connections to the West Country, again, they were deepened when she moved back here in uh, back to Bath this time in 1972 and, and lived in uh, Hay Hill in Bath for about, about three years at that time during the mid 70s. And I think probably the fact that she moved down to what her using her word again, provincial bohemia that really suggests that um, there was something conducive um, to her about that and she it was uh, a welcome to move back to the west country uh, but obviously when she moved back to bath then she was really moving back is uh, really becoming a far more established writer at that day um, but uh, yeah so her, her years in the bath that as they say is another story okay thank you very much <laughs>